All right. While the tech team are tech teaming, <laughs> we might have some more dad jokes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Sorry? The youth don't like it. <laughs> That's ironic, isn't it? Um, before we do that, I just want to honour all of the fathers in the house today, biological fathers, fathers, um, spiritual fathers and fathers alike. Thank you for everything that you do. My father is overseas at the moment, enjoying all of the sights of Europe. Um, but everything that you do often goes unseen by outside and even by um, our own kids, even spiritual kids that we lead. I just want to take a moment to really honour everything that you sacrifice and the commitment that you make um, for your kids and even for those that you lead, whether that's in a work environment, whether that's spiritually, those that you disciple. So thank you for that. Thank you for your investment. Thank you for your commitment. Um, it's, it's so highly valued. It's so highly appreciated. Um, and who knows where the world will be without it. Thank you also uh, to Jake. Thank you for leading the men uh, in men's Real Men 101. Thank you for your investment and the sacrifice that you're making to men. Thank you. As Pastor Mark Driscoll says, it's a learning to be a lion for women and children and a lamb with women and children. So thank you, Jake, for leading that and uh, investing into the de development of the fathers in the house as well. Thank you. And we have got an item for Mark, but thank you, Pastor Mark, for the father of this house. We love you, we appreciate you, we honour you. Can we give thanks to Pastor Mark? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate everything you do. Thanks for leading us. Thank you, church. How are we looking, tech team? We good? All right, let's enjoy Kids Church. share how special our dads and granddads are today. Firstly, I'd like to make a special mention for those dads that have passed on. We too honour you today. Our dads remind us of his tools. Every tool has its purpose and is specifically used for a job. Sometimes our dads need sturdy tools, sharp tools, power tools or maybe twisty tools to get right in there and finish the job. Sometimes they need specially made tools to fix a problem. Sometimes our dad may use the wrong tools and at times to try and get the job done. Like getting the end of a shifter and trying to use it as a hammer. Or using a flathead screwdriver when clearly you need a Phillip head. <laughs> but don't worry, we won't hold it against you. Now let's hear from some kids. Our dad needs a screwdriver to turn us toward God and turn in our relationship with him. Our dad is a great tool. Our granddad needs a sword to cut away worldly temptations that would harm our family. Our granddad is an awesome tool. Our dad needs a ruler to keep us lined up as he follows the Holy Ghost to help lead our family. Our dad is a powerful tool. Yeah. Our dad needs a wrench to, to kill a tight family. My dad is a cool tool. Our dad needed a hammer 
to hammer out any problems in our house. Our dad is a caring tool. Our dad needs sandpaper to smooth out our rough edges. He teaches us to follow our saviour. Our dad is a working tool. Our dad needs a little to stay well balanced as he teaches us to choose the light. Our dad is a little tool. Our dad needs glue to help us seek to the gospel. Our dad is a strong tool. Our dad needs goggles to keep himself safe as he protects us from harm. Our dad is a super strong tool. Some tools get a bit of rust on them, but don't worry, nothing that a bit of CL, CLR can't fix. And that's where our Father in Heaven, through the blood of, blood of Jesus, washes the rust and calcium build up away and makes us sparkling new. God's love is shown in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Kids Church would like to thank our fathers and our grandfathers for your love and support. And we'd all like to say, Happy Father's Day! Pretty much the, the message was build communion around that, that phrase. So that, that's what I've done. So I thought, how can I start with this? And I thought, well, the beginning is a good place. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created light. He separated light from darkness. He, um, he gave us the, the, the fish that's in the sea. He gave us the birds of the air. And he gave us the animals that walk along the ground. Um, and he's, he's given us a lot of stuff. But at that, at that time, he also created other, and it, it replaces obviously the way things that I mentioned, but he created man in his image according to his likeness and said, man is my companion and he made woman. Great decision. At, at, at that time, he then said, go forth, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, take dominion. At this point, we had everything, absolutely everything. But at that time, sin came into the world. into the world, 
God had appointed for him. Now, at that time, God brought the law in. He said, fulfill the law and live. And if we were able to do that, that would have been fine. But the law was righteous and we weren't. So we were able to fulfill the law. But if the law was sufficient, once again, everything's good. We've got everything that we need. God is our provider. He's provided everything for us. But due to our inability to um, fulfill the consequences of our actions, it was not enough. So everything, and this is the phrase that he gave me two weeks ago, everything was not enough. God had to give his all. So to give a, an analogy of that, I can give you my house, my car, my caravan, my boat if I had one, my wife, my children, but until I submit my life, you've received my everything, but you have not received my all. God needed sub to submit his all. So what did he do? He came down, God came down and dwelt amongst us in the form of his son, Jesus. And he was given a purpose to fulfill. John 3.16, which has already been mentioned, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we may not perish but have eternal life. What we couldn't do in our sinful flesh, God did by sending his son for us. And that's a, an absolutely precious gift. In doing that, he cut a diatheke covenant with us. Diatheke covenant meaning that he has done everything. So, when he gave us the law, he gave us the opportunity to fulfill. But we couldn't do it. So the diatheke covenant was, he took response. well, not responsible, yeah, I guess. He took responsibility for what we should have taken responsibility for. He then provided the sacrifice that would fulfill the requirements of the law. And we, our portion in it, as little as it is, is to receive it, to agree with it first, but, and to also receive it. And then we get everything that he's given unto us. That's the love of God. That's God's heart for you. Even though you don't deserve it. Even though you're, you're, you're only worthy because of what he has done. And that's the precious thing. One of the things is, there's a scripture in Isaiah 53, 7. And this is one that is just, I can't really get my head around it. But he said, he was, oppre he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a, sleep, as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He kept, yeah. The thing about that is that he needed to be, he came to this world, he was innocent. He came to this world, he was sinless. He came to this world, he was blameless. And that is the representation of what he had to do when he placed himself on the cross. The thing is that in this scripture, he kept his mouth silent during all of the atrocity, during all of the pain, the anger. The one thing that I would wanting, wanting to do would be to retaliate in some way, shape or form. But could you imagine the words that would come out of your mouth as... Somebody is with a cat and nine tails ripping your flesh out of your back. The words, words that come out are not going to be flash. He had to withdraw. He had to hold himself. He had to hold his position. He needed to remain innocent. He needed to remain blameless. He needed to remain sinless so that he could pay the price. Because if he sinned prior to him being placed on that cross, it would have all been to no avail. That's what he did for us. So I, I can't even fathom the atrocity, but I can't even, well, I can't fathom the atrocity, but I can't even imagine in my mind staying silent during that time. That is just, and that gives you an idea of how much he treasures us, how much he loves us, and how much he wants us to dwell with him. And that we go back to the original pattern, which is to commune with him, to walk in the garden with him. We had it. It was perfect but he's restored us back to that so that we can, once again, walk in that garden and have communion with him.
That's the love of our God for, our pe- for, for, his, for his people, who is us. So please, take your communion elements in your hand. And I came across a, um, yeah, I just want to start off with this, or end with this rather. It's a, um, a beautiful old hymn, and it says, To God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he, or he yield, sorry, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go. Lord, we just want to thank you for what you've done for us. It's amazing. It's, it's unfathomable. And we need to do this in remembrance of you because, Lord, we want to truly acknowledge. We don't want to become familiar with what you have done for us, for the, 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 the pathway that you created for us because you created a way where there was no way. And, Lord, we just give you honor for the covenant that you cut with us, for the blood that you shed and for your body bruised. Lord, that we walk into the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Kids Church, you're welcome to go up. I think they've already gone, haven't they? Fantastic. We're just going to get into a time of giving now. Absolutely. I just want to take you to a place in Leviticus 27 verse 30. Now, Leviticus 27, the whole thing is Old Testament instructions for giving. But specifically in verse 30, it talks about our tithe. And there's something that I would like to highlight um, that is the instruction about tithe that we read in Leviticus 27.30. It says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And just something that I wanted to highlight there is our tithe is holy the bible says so often that everything in the world everything of the world belongs to god haggai tells us that silver belongs to god and gold belongs to god and so everything that we enjoy like paul just talked about everything that was created was created by god for us but it belongs to him and by our giving of that to him it's a holy act There's a holiness of it. It's not just obligation. It's not routine. But there's a holiness. There's a worship that takes place in our giving of our 10%, of our 20 of our however much we want to decide, of our giving to God, that it's a holy, holy act. And Proverbs teaches us that we can honor God with our possessions. But it goes on. It doesn't stop there. By going, by going to honor God with our possessions, by coming and giving our tithe to Him, it also says that we may be filled with plenty and overflow with new wine. And I think of the tying the, together of the two, when we acknowledge the holiness of God in our giving and we honor Him with that, it unlocks portions of heaven that, un, that beforehand might have been unavailable to us because it's the position of our heart to say, I honor God with my tithe, I acknowledge that he's holy and he unlocks new wine to overflow into our life. New wine being represent a representation of blessing. So if there's areas of your life that you're expecting God for blessing in, start in, uh, in acknowledging God for his holiness in our tithe and removing the, like the mindset of it being an obligation or it being um, something that we have to do because we come to church. But it's something that we want to do because we want to honor God in all that he is. We want to honor God for his goodness to us and because it's simply holy in all that it is. So if we, as the collections come, stewards come and collect our tithe this morning, we're just going to pray. 
Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity to honor you with our tithe. We thank you that you are holy. We thank you that we join with the, ang- with the angels and sing holy, Lord God. Lord, we pray this morning that as we give our tithes, that it is uh, honoring to you. Lord, we thank you that uh, it equips you to do your ministry, Lord God. We thank you that we can partner with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, just check your emails um, for all the regular stuff. We're just going to highlight um, some of those other things that are happening in and through the life of the church. Frontline Women um, is coming up on the 21st of September. Uh, it's at Calbar Cafe, and there are three workshops, and it's really important that you b- book in for those workshops. If you want to know a little bit more information about that, talk to Wendy, um, and she can sign you up for all of, um, all of those things. There's also the Brendan Wamsley concert coming up uh, under the stars at Wendy's property um, on the 4th of October. Uh, last year, this was, was uh, an awesome event. We had Brendan Wamsley and his brothers coming um, and leading us in a concert. It's phenomenal. We have some of our Harvest Point gang um, that are also leading uh, or being a part of that music that's happening there as well. Um, there's food stalls to purchase food, um, and it's just a great time of fellowship. If you'd like a little bit more information about that, um, Wendy is also the person to talk to. I'm just going to invite Shelley to come up. She's going to give us some information about Bowie's show, uh, which is happening next week. Good morning, church. What an exciting morning. Um, But more excitement is to come. We've got the Bow Desert show coming on this Friday, 6 and 7. We will be there from 8 in the morning till 7 at night. We're in the Dry Nan Pavilion, which is the main big pavilion. We're actually in the main walk area. We've got a big 6 by 3 tent that is there. Um, We prepare all year for this. There is so much that we're giving away as gifts to families and children. Um, But the main gift we're giving is salvation. The main gift we're giving is the love of God to everybody that passes. Our focus and our heart is really for families this year. Um, We want this place filled and even extended and built on. So um, your prayers are just vital at this time of this week leading up to. If you can just spend a short time in prayer for us in covering for our team. We've got about 20 people. Um, and also, uh, just for us as, as leaders of this, it is really important, but really for our scenic rim and extended, that we have an average of around about 30,000 people come to a show. So I would like to speak to at least a whole bunch of them. And we are, we are in preparation of that. We come with an intent and we come with a purpose. So um, if you are coming to the show, please come and say hello. Please encourage us. Please just join in all the fun. It is a really great show anyway. But um, is there anything else you want to say? Um, For the show, I'd like to pray for an awakening and a revival. And it could start there. You just don't know. As we spread the seed and the word of God there. And we pray for miracles and salvations. Thank you. Real quick, um, we'll be in these shirts that were made. There's about 20 of us, even our Pastor Greggy over here. Um, but yeah, so if you see us, in, come and say hi and just encourage us. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley and Emmanuel. Thank you for the work that you do. There's a lot, a lot of hours that go into preparing for these things. Um, I had the honour of joining them last year. I'll be joining them this year as well. And there's a lot of of hours that they invest into preparing for a space um, where people can come in and then we can have a gospel conversation with them. So thank you for that. Thank you for all that you do uh, behind the scenes. It's appreciated. And I'm just going to invite Jake up. He's going to bring us um, a special item this morning. Uh, happy Father's Day, everybody. Too loud. Um, I'm not going to dance or sing or anything like that. It's not one, one of those type of items. No. no, 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 no. I don't dance since the incident, so 
<laughs> All right. So, how, how good were the kids? Kids were great, yeah? Um, so, fathers, you're just a bunch of two. <laughs> Useful and purpose-built. That's a good way. So, all right, well, since it's Father's Day, how about a joke? Uh, I've, I've, told, I've told this joke at Real Men, so uh, most of the church hasn't he heard it. So, there was a, a pastor, and he had a church, obviously, but it needed repainting. So, he had some paint, but he didn't have enough. So, he, he mixed it up with some water. It's a water-based paint. So, he's painted the building. He stood back. He was proud of himself. And then that night, it rained. And he's gone to the church the next morning. And as he's standing there looking at the building with the washed away paint, a voice from heaven said, repaint and thin no more. It's an oldie, but a goodie. All right. So, the world measures a man by his strength, his wealth, his power, uh, and in Tim's case, wherever he is, by his dashing good looks. Uh, but 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward, outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So what is the kind of heart that God wants to see men have? It's a father's heart, a heart like his. Okay? The father heart of God is the ideal image of what it means to be a good father. To be a lion, to be strong and courageous and inherently dangerous for women and children, and to be loving and gracious and kind for women and children. Therefore, the true measure of a man is calculated by his capacity to be a blessing to women and children. This can be done directly by either being a father, whether you have one, two, six or eight kids. A school teacher could be directly influencing the children in his class. A carer, one-on-one -on -one with someone, a young man. A, father could be a, a man could be a father to a young man. Indirectly, this could be a soldier liberating a, an oppressed country or a nation. Could be a businessman providing employment for men and women for their children, to provide for their children. Building and construction. Perfect example, infrastructure, roads, buildings, schools. That can be a blessing for women and children. And being a primary producer, providing food, as farmers. Now, I was asked to provide a, give a word for our father of the house, Pastor Mark. I missed a phone call from, um, from Amanda, but then she sent a text message, and immediately after I read the text message, the word came to me, and that is strong tower. Mark, you are our strong tower. Not just for the church, but for the community. Now, a strong tower is characterized by its strong foundations. It is sturdily built and it is fortified. It provides a place of safety and provision, guidance, comfort and direction, emotional support and help during difficult times. Pastor Mark, I'd like you to stand up and come join me on stage. We have a gift for you. I don't know what it is, but it's heavy. <laughs> mm. So, Mark, we would like to honour you as the father of our house, as the father of this church. You've done well over the past, how long have you been here? Ten years? Nine years? Ten years? Just about. You've, uh, you've taken this church from strength to strength, and we want to honour you for that. So I'd like the church to give a standing ovation for our Father of the House. And we're going to pray for Pastor Mark. So I can get Ray, Dad, come up. 
We're just going to lay hands on Mark. We're going to pray for him. Father God, we thank you that you are our Father and you are the perfect example of what is required of us as fathers, as men, Lord. And today we lift up Pastor Mark to you as our Father and Father of this house. Lord, we pray that you give him guidance and strength and continue to pour out your wisdom and your anointing on his life. And you continue that he continues to grow in you, Lord. And we lift him up and give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Pastor Mark. But before you sit down, we're going to invite you back up. <laughs> Mark's going to bring us around the word this morning. So as he comes, just welcome him. Day. You know, it's not about being commercial, it's about the honour of fathering. And the Bible says in Ephesians 3 verses 14 to 15, it says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole hev- family of heaven and earth is named. And today we honour the Father God, amen. amen. Can we just take one moment and just stand in adoration of Him today? the Heavenly Father, and give Him praise and honour. Father, we thank You today that we give You because under Your name and under Your control and under Your authority, we are here today. It's only by Your name and by Your authority and by example of which You've set. And Father, we thank You today for the fathering of our Heavenly Father given to us as humanity. We bless Your name today. We glorify You. Father, You're the one we've been singing about as you've come through the example of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've heard so powerfully communion about the love of God and the extent of God's anguish to redeem, to restore relationship back to the Father of humanity. And we're thankful today, Lord, we stand amongst a group of people this morning here in this fellowship called Harvest Point Church who have acknowledged and received, as Paul so eloquently said this morning, we've received of the grace of God and the mercy to be restored back to our Father. So we stand in honour today of the one and only Father who deserves all the praise, all the glory, all the honour. We bless you today, Father God, we give you praise that you've graced us with your life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning and uh, today I'm going to do something differently. I'm going to invite my father and perhaps you don't know if you're newer to the church here haven't met or acknowledged that this would be my father David Einside who's going to come and join me on the platform I'm going to invite him to take a seat but as he does that come dad when you're ready just come walk (laughs) he's good thank you Jennifer
to say. Praise the Lord. Yeah, just sit down. That'd be great. That's right. Everyone give Dad a round of applause for sitting down. Uh, and just as we get ourselves organized here, I think as the tech crew got a little video Pastor Grace sent that you can share and put those photos up on the screen. We just want to show a couple of photos. Today, I'm going to, as we've honored Father God, I want to honor my father for being an amazing father. Just as Jake has so eloquently spoken of the house here and talked about fathering, I want to, for you to hear from my father this morning as I honor him. And the best way I can do that is to ask him some questions and see. There's some pictures on the back here of our family, and it all stemmed from my father here. His children, his grandkids, the sideways one. Another sideways one. Another sideways one. Another sideways one. There's dad. Son and grants. And believe it or not, that's dad and me when I was good looking. <laughs> Just hold it there if you like. That'd be great. And what I'd like to do is um, just acknowledge today that my father, David Ironside, is here. And what a wonderful dad he was to myself, Mark, to Andrew, the second, Jennifer, who's here, my sister, and the younger brother, Nathan. So David Ironside's the father of four children, grandchildren, and now great-grandchildren. It's just an honor to have him here this morning, and um, I'm going to ask him some questions, and we're going to hear a little bit about his life in, in honor of his life today as a father, uh, my father. But a verse that Dad used, he may even mention himself a little later, was a verse from Proverbs 22.6. And he said, train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. And you, know, you can say that verse really quickly or you can actually grab a hold of the truth there and decide I'm going to apply that truth to my life and I'm going to attach faith to it and believe God that when they're old, they will not depart from it. Amen. And that's been the legacy and the heritage of which our father, my father, David Ironside, has lived by and has seen the blessing of God flow through in a powerful way. I'm just going to pass this mic, Dad, just see if it works. Yes, well. Hang on. Is that okay? Yes. So we're going to sit down here. Let's just pray, Dad. Father, we thank you today for this blessed opportunity to honour fathers in the house today as we appreciate our Heavenly Father, the Creator of all. Thank you, Father God, today for the great men, fathers in this house today, the wonderful families, the legacies that are even here in this building this morning. We give you praise for their lives and all that they've done and all they've achieved. We bless fathers today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've got a number of questions here. I'm going to ask my father some questions. So to start with, Dad, a bit of background to your life, a bit of history. What year were you born and where were you born? Well, Mark... I was actually born in Mackay, Queensland. My ancestors, my grandparents on the Ironside side, 
actually came from Scotland and they were cane farmers and my dad was a cane farmer. Mm. My grandfather on the other side came out from the UK. He actually sailed from a city called Lancashire and Mark doesn't have this in the notes. <laughs> but he lived in Perth and as a youngster, he got on a tricycle and rode from Perth to Fremantle. Now, I believe that was 12 miles in those days. Somebody might be able to correct me there, but that's a little bit of history. What? But I don't think you've heard yet. No. no. And what year were you born? I was born, it was 1938. Right. We've actually written some of these things down because I can get my dates screwed up. <laughs> So, it's good to get some background, isn't it? You've all got background to your life, and you're going to hear from David Ironside for a few minutes this morning. Dad, looking back on your working career, what do you feel your greatest accomplishments were? And primarily, you were an entomologist in Queensland, specialising with macadamia nuts. Can you tell us what do you feel was the greatest accomplishments of your working life? That's another very interesting question, Mark. And just to make a point, we had a men's group on Friday night and a gentleman in the group was asking me some questions and it came out, wh when did you actually start work? And I said, it was 1920. Now, the conversation went on and he said, when were you born? <laughs> so we've decided we should put some dates down. <laughs> I was actually born in 1938. And you started work when? Well, it was before he was born. <laughs> he was actually born in 1963. Mm -hmm. And I started work in 2060. <laughs> 1960. 1960. That's right. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so... What was the greatest accomplishment? We established the fact you started working in 1960. That's correct. In the well, Department of Primary Industries. Yes, yes. It was known as the Department of Agriculture and Stock That's right. in those days. Mm -hmm. And I was born working on pineapples. And the reason for that was... Pineapples suffered from a problem called nematodes. Nem nematodes mm -hmm. eat, the, eat the roots of the pineapple. And that was an accomplishment. That was just a couple of years' work. Mm. But then macadamia nuts had come on the scene and they asked me to look at a problem that occurred on the flowers of macadamia nut. And so that's where it really got started, macadamias. Mm. For those who don't know, my father's written a book about the pests of macadamias and has an insect named after him. Is that right, Dad? <laughs> What's it called? Should I say? Yeah. It's called Aereococcus 
ein Sorry Eye. That's wonderful, isn't it? Dad, how old were you when you became a dad? Just really quickly. Short answer. I became a dad in 1962. Is that safe? Three. <laughs> Was it 1963? No, no, that's when you started. Oh. Oh. Just in short, Dad, how did, <laughs> how did your career affect your role as a father? Did it affect you at all with the decisions you made or was it impactful or not impactful? Well, it, it was impactful. It, it really did impact my precious wife, Norma. And it impacted you guys, Grace and Mark. It in, impacted all of us. One of, one of the things that came up was I became a Winston Churchill Fellow. I was uh, awarded a study tour to go to the United States of America and that was in 1985. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. So how did that affect, or that decision, how did it affect your fathering or the roles of father, well, would you say? One, one of the things that we had to get over was, of course, you had had children by that time. And they were, of course, our grandchildren. And my precious wife had to embark on a tour to Africa, which meant that she would not see our grandchildren growing up. This was a tough time. So you took Nathan? Our, our youngest boy, Nathan. He was, what, 19 younger than, younger than you mm -hmm. at that time. And we took Nathan with us to America. And one, one of the things that occurred was actually a repetition of something that had occurred years beforehand. Years beforehand, I'm not sure how old this man was, but he was old enough to wander off to the local shop. <laughs> and his mother did not know where he was as far as we were concerned he was lost. But eventually somebody from the shop recognised him and brought him back home to our place. Now, I'm not sure exactly if this is all correct, Norma, <laughs> because I did not exactly see it happen. But this fella came into the house... And Norma got him and she was sitting on him and she was whacking him, I tell you what. And he never went to the shop on his own again. Lesson, lesson learned, eh? They do bad things once. <laughs> you see, the, the, 
the scripture that Norma, I, Norma and I had, which we took to heart, is found in Proverbs 22 and verse 6. It's already been mentioned, I think. The scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go, in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. And he never has. So the lesson out of that one is sit on him, <laughs> hold him down, and give him a flogging. Are you learning something today? Yeah. If I can read that Bible verse, Proverbs 22, 6 from the Passion, it says this, Dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go. And the values they've learned from you will be with them for life. Isn't that powerful? It's so wonderful. So thank you, Dad, for uh, your correction. When dad would correct us, he would say things like, son, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. But I'm doing it because I love you. And it was hard to reconcile that in a mind of a child. And so I would encourage parents, you will never reconcile that thought in the mind of your children. But if you'll train them and discipline them in the way they should go, they will not depart from it. And dad used to say, and we learned later on raising our children, if you, it hurts the parent sometimes more than it hurts the child. But it's okay because the children will come out pretty good. So take that lesson today. Another question for Dad today. Dad, when did you receive Christ as your Lord and Saviour becoming born again? That is difficult. The answer is, isn't exactly clear cut. But I did dedicate my life fully as a young man when the Billy Graham crusade first came to Australia. But I want to say, over the years, as a, as a dad, I've never been what you could say, a perfect dad. Never been, even, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I haven't been a perfect man. We didn't have the lessons that are being taught by Jake at that point. But I want, want to tell you a one verse of scripture that is, stood me instead over many years. And it's in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. If the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Yeah. So today we do thank God for the precious, precious blood of Jesus. I think the question was, when did I first come to Jesus? Mm. <laughs> I, made, I mentioned the Billy Graham crusade. I didn't mention my, tame, my time, time at the Queensland Agricultural College at Gatton. And it was there that I made a strong commitment to the Lord Jesus as my saviour based on the scripture 
that has already been mentioned, John 3.16. Thank you, Dad. I think it was 1958. That was it. That was the date, yes. That's good. Next question, Dad, is when did you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and was this experience impactful on your fathering? Well, what can you say? <laughs> no, we were married, no more, no more, 1962. And it was in that year. We were attending the small Assembly of God Church, which was at that time in Wombai, Queensland. And there was a man, you'd probably, you've probably heard of him, but his, his name was Tommy Evans. And he, he is descendant today. Mm. Can you tell, tell us about that? Well, Russell Evans of Planet Shakers is, yeah. is the grandson of Tommy Evans who came and visited Mumbai, and I believe that's where you received the encounter of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yes, yes. Tommy and his wife, Esther, said, because at, at that time, if you wanted to receive the baptism, the, the, the thing was, wait. But Tommy and Esther brought something new to the church. And Tommy said, if you want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you've got three seconds. His wife, Esther, said, oh, Daddy, give them three minutes. <laughs> and, and, and my wife, Norma, she actually received the baptism in the Holy Spirit before I did. We... I, we'd been back, we'd been married, of course, 1962, and it was in the same year that we received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The both of us did. Whew. That's great. Did that impact on your fathering? That Holy Spirit baptism, the language of the Holy Spirit. Well, it did. It, it's hard to describe. But in those days, you better believe it, I was a fanatic. <laughs> I was determined that my kids were going to grow up. They were going to be trained in the ways of God because when they were old, they're not going to depart from it. And, and add, added to that, I think Norma won't mind me saying this. <laughs> I've already t told something. But when he was born, Norma suffered some serious tears. I think the ladies would understand that. And this required her to have an ascetic. The, the medical people had to do what they had to do. But my wife, Norma, is becoming conscious. And she began to prophesy. And she began to speak over this baby. And said, this baby is going to grow up and be a man of God and he's going to preach the gospel. <laughs> so she had a very strong impact on this baby. Thank you. So, Dad, who was a mentor 
that helped you along the way through your life? And how did that mentorship help you? I think we talked about a couple of people. Yeah, I could, I could mention uh, Cyril Alcorn, if any of you knew the uh, Alcorns. Cyril had a younger brother named Ivan Alcorn, and he was uh, strongly at work with young people in the Brisbane area. But Cyril Alcorn was a Methodist pastor and he was actually principal of my college. I won't give you the dates. <laughs> but he was very influential in my life. Charles Towers. In, in Charter Stowers, yes. In those years, Karen. Mm. Who else was a mentor for you, Dad? Well, there was a, a precious brother who's going to be with Jesus, his wife. His, his name was Morris Smith. If any of you knew of the Smiths, they lived in... Nambour also. That's where you were born in Nambour. Mm -hmm. In fact, our four children were all born in Nambour. Mm. Our youngest, have we mentioned Nathan? Mm -hmm. He's actually live, living in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio at present. And he's, he's a musician, he's a preacher, he's a singer, uh, he's just doing what they did. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Mm. We can just thank God for our children, because that's what they did. And that, that verse, Proverbs 22, 6, you might like to check it out, see that we've got it right. It's, it's just been foundational throughout our married lives. Before we were married, we would say, we have no intention of raising our children for the devil. No, no. That wasn't, that wasn't part of our plan. Our plan was to train them in the ways of God. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. Another mentor you mentioned to me, Dad, was a, a great man of God in America who became a, a leader in your life, mentor. Yeah, I think everybody here probably knows the name. It was was E.W. Kenneth E. Hagen. Yeah. Kenneth E. Hagen. He, and today you, you'll find his books. Uh, he went to be with Jesus when he was over 80. Uh, but he, he was... Uh, he actually came to Brisbane for a full gospel businessmen's convention. And at that time, we were looking towards... Africa, mission work and so, so forth in Africa. And Kenneth, Kenneth E. Hagen, one of his ministry gifts, great, great teacher, great teacher in the Word of God. You, you can find his books today. But one of his ministry gifts was in the prophetic. And... Me and Norma thinking about Africa and so on. Go and talk to Kenneth Hagen. He's in Brisbane. And and so I, I I found my way to talk to him and told him I wanted to go to Africa, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I was looking for a prophetic utterance, you know, 
do this and do this myself. But no, what did he say? You go and pray about it. Yeah. Mm. So they pay great influence in your life spiritually. Oh, yes. Yeah. Is there any high points of celebration for you being a father? Something that comes to mind? That's, that's very interesting. We haven't got that in our notes, have we? <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, high points were just too numerous, really, to mention. But one thing happened in America. We were there. Mark and Grace were at Charleville. They were busy having children. We missed out on those children. So that was, you could say, a high point, but we missed it. <laughs> but I think the point you were leading up to was you watched Nathan, part of the ministry there, in America, wasn't it, where it oh, impacted yeah. his life? Yeah. That was one of the yeah. accounts. I, I was actually going to talk about that. Right. But this I wanted to mention because what he did and what Nathan did, there was some relationship there. We were living in a place called College Station, Texas, and I was attending the Texas A&M University for a couple month or two, and we were living in accommodation provided by the university, and Nathan was about four years old, and we, we had Nathan going off to kids' church, they, they all had to go to kids' church. You can be sure of that. And Nathan, was he 19? You were 19 years older than him. Mm. And so he had to stay and look after his family. But we took Nathan with us. Nathan's sister was here but she's here this morning. But she was not there when we went to the UK. She stayed here. She actually did the things that she wanted to do. And I'm, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but, but, but I do want to mention that Nathan went missing in America and America is not a place to lose your kids <laughs> you can be sure of that Nathan went missing one day well that was that was really uh, something that concerned us at the time but I'm full, pleased to say that Norma didn't sit on him. <laughs> but Nathan had actually gone off to visit one of the college students at the A&M University and he, we eventually got him back. <laughs> and that, that was a relief. But it was at the College A&M University that Nathan received Jesus. And you, you can see that the things that happened in our lives was impacting us and impacting our children. And they've all been impacted in one way or another. And was it Big John? Oh, yes, yes, there was Big John, a fellow there, 
six foot eight. Yeah, we got some uh, six foot eight guys. Yes, we got one here. Yeah. Well, Big John was his kids' church teacher. And, and Big John introduced Nathan to Jesus. And this is something that has, well, stayed with Nathan all of his life until this day. But when we got back to, to 7 Lingard Street, Palmwoods, that's correct? Yeah. <laughs> that, we had a big avocado tree in the yard. And, and being such a big tree, I built a swing on the tree for Nathan. He didn't get to do it. You were past it. Mm. <laughs> but we came back from the USA and Nathan had gotten on the swing and I went out, out to see him and he's there praying in tongues on the swing. And, and so the visit to the USA has had ongoing impact on, on us as a family. Mm. That's great. To wrap it up today, Dad, what would you say your personal values or the main personal values that you've utilised in fathering? Well, one of them is found in Ephesians. Chapter 6. And it, it, it talks about likewise, you children obey your parents in the Lord. This is the right thing to do. Mm. And I just want to thank God. Yeah. Our children, even today, have obeyed us in the Lord. And further than that, the scripture says, honour your father and your mother, that it might be well with you and that you might live long on the earth. And that's a promise, not only to fathers, but a promise to their children also. I think um, as we close this time today, Dad, it's... Um you've instilled into our family godly values and a heritage and a legacy which is still blessing many people today. And you said to me the other day when we were talking about this that the story of your life is more about God's faithfulness, His mercy, His grace and the Word of God working in your life and it flowed into our lives, the power of prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus. And so that was the story of David Einside and how these open heart to Jesus, to the working of the Holy Spirit, has not only impacted his life, it's impacting our life and the children's children and still working today. And one thing we talked about in our pre-conversations were for parents and grandparents not to negate the bringing of your children to church. To teach them the Word of God at home. To lead them in Bible stories. As we wrap this time up together, you know, I remember it was morning and night we would have the Word of God read to us at the dinner table, breakfast and evening. So much so that we had my grandmother visiting one time and Dad would lead us in the verses of Romans 10, 9 and 10, which talks about that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And Dad would have us repeat that over and over again and until one day Mum said to Dad, Man, if we have to say this thing one more time, I'm going to blow up. <laughs> but you know, the revelation of that scripture touched my mother's life and touched her mother, my grandmother, and still impacting us today as a revelation of these truths. Even though you think you know it, if you meditate on God's word, look, it'll become life to you. Something will come alive. And that's some of the principles and the things that my father here, David Ironside, taught us. And so if it feels like we hammer this church a bit with the word of God, there's a reason behind it. Amen. We were born into this and thus we'll live by it and know it works in our lives. It's working in your lives today to the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> As we close today, this story is about God's faithfulness, Dad. And I know in this room today, I pray that many of you just draw upon the faithfulness of God. That you yourself in your own way would partake of His grace, His goodness, and find the truths of God for yourself and apply them to your life. Don't try and religiousize it. Don't try and secularize it. Don't try and theorize it, but let it become practically yours and apply it to your everyday life. Then I pray a little bit of the story of Dad's today. It's, it's my way that you've graced me today as the pastor of this church to hear a few stories of the life of my father. And for those of you who have not known him, this is the man he is. And what a wonderful man he is. And Dad, I honour you. Yeah. And thank you for the love, the care, the support. <laughs> the training, the sitting upon, <laughs> and the flogging. <laughs> you know what? It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't hurt. It hurts at the time. It hurts your pride. But it doesn't hurt you as a person. And um, Dad, we honour you today. And I know this church is happy to honour you as my father. And we thank you for the man you are. And thank you for the legacy you've left behind. And still working, not only here in Australia, it's working in the nations of the world as we've been allowed to go. And our grandkids will go and touch many people. So bless you today. Thank you, David Einside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you stand up. Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel I'd be missing something if I didn't remind you of the verse of Scripture that we've already talked about that says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spirit, but to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And I want to tell you that that verse of Scripture has powerful meaning in my life today. Mm. And I trust that it will have powerful meaning for everyone that is here today. Mm. God bless you richly. As the worship, as thank you, as the worship team are coming, thank you guys. This morning we're going to have a break for morning tea, lunch, and um, I please pray that you, you, you join us in the cafe. I'm going to ask Dad to pray a blessing over us this morning as we go. Sorry, and uh, don't forget that some of the fathers have bought some um, show and tell out there. Please walk around and have a look. And uh, there's some interesting things to look at on the tables and the patio and outside there. Please enjoy some fellowship and the meal. The, the kitchen staff have done a great job preparing some food for us today on this great Father's Day. And if you're here and you need to go, and some have already gone because they've got pre-appointments, we, we, we bless you today. But I'm going to ask my father to pray for us as a family of God before we go this morning. I want him to pray a blessing upon fathers here today. 
Would you do that, please, Dad? Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for listening to us. Listening to the precious word of God and some of my rambles. But Jesus, we thank you. The lover of our souls. The one who did shed his blood. The one who came to bring us to the Father. And I pray for everyone in our midst today, and particularly every father, every young man, every older man, for the word of God to grow and increase and multiply in every life that many, many more people will come to know and love Jesus just as they will in our pastor's life. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Oh, oh. <laughs> well. Great. Thank you, church. <laughs> Heavenly Father, bless us gathering today as we go. Thank you for the love of God and the power of His Holy Word today. Thank you for the mighty Holy Ghost today working in lives. Lord, bless the fathers of this house today, every young man, every older man. And Lord, as we have festivities today, lunches and dinners and whatever we do, thank you for the union. Thank you for the fathering of the living God over his family, the family of God. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Don't forget tonight's prayer meeting tonight. Also, prayer for revival, 6 p.m. for an hour. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, worship team. You should lead us in a song to go. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I see lightning, I hear thunder. Something stirring six feet under. Dead things coming back to life again. I believe there's about to be another resurrection. Well, I see signs and I see wonders. Birds of living color. Dead things coming back to life again. I believe there's about to be another resurrection.